slightly hard to human today so I thought to cheer myself up I would start a new reading vlog and I'm hoping to have this done so that I can post it between Christmas and New Year which I'm hoping will also keep some of you company who need to be kept company around that time let's keep each other company um, so today I want to start a new themed reading vlog and in this vlog I'm going to be reading novels that remind me of other novels that I have loved and to do this I'm going to be shopping my own shelves. I have a few ideas of where I'm going to go, I know where I'm starting. So the two that I have in front of me, these are two books that remind me of a favourite book of 2021 for me. So these are two companion novels, they're called Mr Bridge and Mrs Bridge and I just find the premise of this really fascinating. So I don't know if they document exactly the same events or if one follows the other, but either way, they are the story of one marriage, but one is from the point of view of the husband and one is from the point of view of the wife. Can't help but notice that the husband's novel is significantly longer. So these are by Evan S. Connell. And Mrs. Bridges one says, Mrs. Bridge is a housewife and a mother in Kansas City, bringing up her three children and making a home for her husband, Walter. She shops, plays bridge and goes to the country club. But as time passes, she finds that her life is unfulfilling and she cannot even ask herself the questions that trouble her. And while the children grow up and become strangers to her, Mrs. Bridge, kind yet bigoted, rich yet simple, is left uncertain of her place in the world. And I wanted to start with this one because it's reminding me of Mrs. March by Virginia Vito, which I read early this year. It's one of my favorite books of 2021. And I don't know if they're gonna be similar, but both are about housewives who are very opinionated and prejudiced, and they are lacking purpose, and they have husbands who don't treat them very well. So yeah, I'm both fascinated by the premise of presenting two novels about characters that are married to each other, and then I'm also interested in how I can parallel that with Mrs. March by Virginia Vito and try and see if I think maybe even Mrs. March is inspired by Mrs. Bridge because Mrs. March came out this year in 2021 and Mrs. Bridge came out in uh, 1959. So this has been a while. So let's begin here. I'm also going to make some veggie bacon naan breads today. Mr M and I used to really like going to Dishoom, which is an Indian restaurant. They have a few chains in London and actually now and I think Manchester and Edinburgh. And for breakfast they do these bacon naans and you can actually buy some meal kits to be sent to your house to make the naans, but I decided I would try and make my own today. So I have some naan bread rising in the kitchen. I have bought some vegan bacon, which looks like this. I will insert it on the screen here. And basically you make the naan bread and then you put cream cheese in the inside with chili jam and the bacon and coriander if you like coriander, but I'm one of the people who, is it a genetic thing where coriander tastes like soap to you? I have that anyway, so I will not be putting coriander in. But yeah, I'm gonna make that to uh, also make me feel more human today. Uh, and let's, let's start this reading vlog. <laughs> I have made an error. I'm normally good when I buy stuff online. If it's things that need to be a very specific size, I do check, but I did not check the size of these. So my Christmas present um, for a couple of people, two people, was gonna be gingerbread um, biscuits. <laughs> and this is my Christmas cookie cutter set. It's cute, we've got like a, a woolly hat, um, these are my favorites, there's some more in here, a jumper, 
a Christmas tree. This is a gingerbread man and I had an idea. I thought if I turn him upside down, I think I can turn this into a reindeer. Can you see it? I'll show you in a bit um, when I try and bring that vision to life. And I thought that was a really clever idea and then I Googled it and realized that loads of people already do that. But at least I know that it does work. Anyway, so these are the size of the cookie cutters. And I thought, I know I'll buy some, you know, nice tins um, to put them in. So I bought a couple of old tea tins, which actually have tea in. Uh, and my plan was to empty them of tea and then to put the, the biscuits inside. But as we can see, I didn't, I didn't measure things. So, um, I think Sana's going to get her, her biscuits in Tupperware. And I think that's just going to have to be fine. It's not her main present anyway. So that's okay. And I thought with these, one of my aims is to try macarons because I haven't tried those before. And those will definitely fit in here. So if I can master macarons, this will actually be a really good size, um, for gifting people macarons um so in the meantime these could just also be gifted as tea but i think i'm going to keep them save them for smaller baking projects so yeah i have baked some gingerbread biscuits i'm waiting for them to cool so i will show you the decoration uh, and then i'm going to go for a walk and hand them to sana i hope you're having a good day um let's crack on my vision gingerbread man Reindeer. Oh, the focus is not enjoying that. <laughs> hoping that this lighting is cozy and not just dark. <laughs> it's a couple of days later and I finished reading Mrs. Bridge and Mr. Bridge. And I, I liked reading Mrs. Bridge in particular, Mr. Bridge less so. They're not books I would highly recommend. Um, as I speculated at the beginning of this video, I would put bets on this having had influence on Mrs. March by Virginia Vito. And then Mrs. Bridge in turn, I would say is definitely influenced by Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf. So we have three books here that have had a knock-on effect on each other. Mrs. Bridge is about a housewife um, who lives in Kansas City and it's set in the 1930s. It's written in 1959. Mr. Bridge was written 10 years after that and they do cover a lot of the same events but it didn't feel very repetitive and they definitely could have been in one book. Imagery wise it is nice to have two books on a shelf because, you know, even though they are married, they are not together in in many ways. Mrs. Bridge also reminded me a little bit of Between the Acts by Virginia Woolf because it is set in the interwar period and it has that reflection between tension in politics and a war brewing and tension in her house um, and things feeling as though to her they're going to come to a head because basically she feels as though she doesn't understand her purpose or her place in the world and she just wants to scream and she imagines that one day just everything is going to explode. 
There is a lot of imagery in here that I appreciated, but also felt rather heavy handed. So for instance, she buys some beautiful suitcases for a trip that they're going to go on, but she's so worried that they're going to get damaged that she buys a really horrible suitcase cover, which means that no one gets to see the beautiful suitcases. And look, that is a, a metaphor for who she is as a person. And then also one day she goes into the study and she picks up a copy of Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad, opens a page and happens to read a passage on how you shouldn't skim through life. She's skim reading it. She then doesn't have time to read the rest of it because she gets busy and is called away. So there's a lot of stuff like that, which I think would be fun to, you know, write an essay about maybe, but it didn't feel particularly subtle. I had hoped that this was going to be darker than it was. It didn't really unravel as much as I had hoped. It's not that unpleasant things don't happen in this book, it's just I would have liked it to have gone further. As readers, we can sympathise with Mrs Bridge because she's clearly depressed and it doesn't matter what your circumstances are in life, you can still be depressed and that's not a fun time for anybody. At the same time, she's also not a very nice person. So the sympathy uh, runs out at some point, not for the depression, but just for her overall as a person. She is racist, she is homophobic, and she doesn't have a lot of time for, for many people. And a lot of that stems from resentment because she feels like no one takes the time to understand her as well. But it is a bit, bit of a circular thing. And also she blots out a lot of things that could help her because of the prejudices that she has. I like reading about unlikable characters, but there needs to be something bigger going on. And the problem that I have with these two books is that the entire book is the dislikable character in both cases. The plot is them. So I would have liked more to have been happening. It feels more like their diary, even though it's not told from a first person perspective. In Mr Bridge there are some really uncomfortable parts where he is talking about how he's attracted to his daughters and it's like this weird feeling that he has once which is a consequence of him not being able to express himself and repressing his emotions in general and then it coming out in weird ways. It happens multiple times. I think it's supposed to be deliberately uncomfortable. And then the afterword I was reading and I was not okay with the way that the afterword was, was normalizing like racism and homophobia in this book. And then there was also this part that said the, the bits where he's attracted to his daughter, surely readers nowadays would read that and think it was terrible. And that that is because, let me find the, the quote, in the years since this novel was published, Western culture has taken a giant step backwards towards the prudish, the squeamish, the repressive, the punitively normative in relation to anything concerning children and sex. I, f I just found this afterward deeply uncomfortable. Like, the novel itself is one thing, but how we frame it in the modern day is another thing. Um, but then I realised that the afterword was written by Lionel Shriver, and then it made a lot more sense. So um, I wouldn't hugely recommend these books. I'm glad that I have read them. I think especially Mrs. Bridge. Mr. Bridge, less so. I could have probably done without it. Not a huge success so far, but, but lots to think about. The sun is about to set, so I've chased the light to the window, which I think is making me look like a ghost, but that's actually quite apt because I've decided the next book that I'm going to pick up. So recently I read Finkersmith by Sarah Waters and then I watched a video on the Man Booker YouTube channel, which I'll link in the description box down below, where she was talking about inspiration for this book. And she basically said that she had lifted a huge part of the plot from The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. I've never read Wilkie Collins before. He never came up in my Victorian uh, reading classes or anything at university, but he is my grandma's favourite writer and she loves the Moonstone in particular, which I do own. Um, but I thought I would listen to the audiobook of The Woman in White and it's kind of apt actually that Wilkie Collins um, is my grandma's favourite writer because the audiobook of The Woman in White, or at least one of them that I found, is narrated by Ian Holm. And Ian Holm really, really, and has always <laughs> reminded me of my grandpa who passed away 10 years ago now, more than 10 years, actually. Um, and this is, my, this is my grandpa being really cool, playing the piano. He's the reason that I learned to play the piano because he was really passionate about music. But you can see that he really looks like Ian Holm. So I am gonna listen to the audiobook of one of my grandma's favourite books, narrated by someone who uh, 
reminds me very much of of her husband my my grandpa so that's really lovely and as i said that is going to be similar to fingersmith um i think it's oh I'd, the problem is i don't want to give spoilers for fingersmith but essentially if you've read it one of the first if not the first um big twist i think is probably what's been taken from the woman in white um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to reading that. It's about a man who lives in London and then goes to a house. He's an art teacher um, and then he gets to know two women who live there. So I will report more on that once I have, uh, once I've read some of it. But let's go for a walk while I listen to some of that. I'll include some walking footage here. clearly continuing my quest to try and look like a ghost in this vlog. Um, it is actually me from the future. I've been editing this vlog and the clips after this I end up talking about other books and I forgot to come back and check in with you about The Woman in White so I'm just going to quickly insert this clip here. Uh, it is also Christmas Day as I'm filming this so Merry Christmas to those who celebrate. Um, I I'm liking The Woman in White, but it's a really, really weird reading experience because I'm liking it because of the narration, which is so over the top. Um, Ian Holm manages to just insert so much emotion into sentences that I think if you've read them on the page would just be a bit banal. So I like that he elevates kind of everything. It makes it really enjoyable to listen to but primarily I'm enjoying it because I'm always thinking about Fingersmith and I'm not sure I would be enjoying it really if I hadn't read Fingersmith and weren't constantly trying to make links between the two just because it's probably not the kind of thing I would choose to pick up on my own at this point in my life and because of that I don't really know how to recommend it to you apart from saying if you have read and loved Fingersmith then maybe you will like the audiobook narration of this as well and obviously if you read a lot more Victorian fiction than I do then then probably you will enjoy this one as well but in that case you may have already read it so I don't know how helpful that recommendation is and um, as I mentioned it is about an art teacher and he uh, lives in London and it was really weird I was listening to it as I was walking across the heath on the mistiest day of the year and it wasn't the the video clip that I inserted just before because that was not a misty day but I did take some photos which I'll insert here so let me shuffle across so that you can see the photos. It was the mistiest day ever. It was really creepy and really beautiful. And as I was walking, I was listening to the beginning of the book and it's about a misty evening on Hampstead Heath, which is where I was, when the character is walking around and thinking that everything looks quite 
haunted and I just really enjoy it when strange coincidences like that happen. So he's walking on the heath and he comes across this woman who's the woman in white, that's what he calls her, and she says that she's trying to find someone and she runs away and then it turns out that she has escaped from an asylum and the police are looking for her and he feels very strange about it because he thinks well she didn't seem as though she was very confused she seemed as though she knew what she was talking about and he wasn't sure why she had been put in an asylum in the first place and after that he's offered a job in Cumberland so he travels across the country to go and um, teach these two sisters how to draw and when he gets there he realises that one of them looks exactly like the woman in white so that's the very beginning of the book it's a 25 hour long audio book so I'm going to be listening to it for a really long time I don't even know if I'll finish it by the end of December in which case I'll talk about it in my January wrap up um there's a lot of uh disparaging stuff about women inside which you know do we enjoy that no um but it's also not flat when it comes to that because it's a woman primarily who is spouting this hatred against women and she's doing it to try and get the main character on side she's doing that i'm not like the other girls thing i know the weaknesses of my sex um and that is interesting to to think about but i don't think there's really a lot in the book that also negates what she's saying <laughs> but you know it's a victorian novel so as I was talking about with Mrs. Bridge earlier, it's important to contextualize things and understand them, but at the same time not erase like all the stuff inside, you know? Am I talking properly? I don't know, it's Christmas. Um, uh, yeah, this is not very festive chat, is it? Uh, and also you can probably hear the washing machine in the background, so you are welcome for that. Um, so yeah, I'm enjoying it, but let me, uh, leave you like cut to future clips now where I talk about other books and in another video at some point in the future I will come back and talk to you about my complete thoughts on The Woman in White once I have reached the end. Her frank, fearless face answered for her before she spoke. Do you think I would remain an instant in the company of any man whom I suspected of such baseness as that? She asked angrily. Hi, happy Christmas Eve. It is my final day of work for about a week or so and I haven't decided which book I'm going to read next and I thought I would let you pick but you from the past so I'm gonna ask on Instagram now so by the time you're watching it you will have already picked and I would have already read the book but these are the books I've pulled off my shelves I'm gonna give people on Instagram the choice to pick from because as I said at the beginning I'm shopping my shelves for this so these are books that immediately remind me of other books and there are loads of others on my shelves I could pick from I could turn this into a series we'll see so this is the hierarchies by Roz Anderson this is a book about an AI um, who has been bought by a husband to satisfy his needs and she is integrated into this family it's reminding me a little bit of Clara and the Sun that's not what the AI in that book does but it it seems a similar premise to Ishiguro's novel then this is Greensmith by Alia Whiteley and I love her books this one is a dystopian book set in space and it's about a horticulturist who's trying to save the world from this virus that is spreading across the universe. It's quite different from books that I normally read. She writes magical realist, um, fabulous fiction, but she also does really epic sci-fi stuff as well. So occasionally I will kind of move into that territory and read some of her books. So this one is another one people could choose from and it gives me slight vibes of Premi Mohammed and also of Sue Rainsford. This is The Sparrow by Mary Doria Russell, which has been sitting on my shelf for ages and again is set in space. This one I bought because so many of you said the premise of this one reminds you of The Book of Strange New Things by Michelle Faber, which is one of my favorite books ever. So this one is quite big and it's about a group of um, Christians who go into space to preach the word of God to an alien life form. So that one is book number three. Then this is English Monsters by James Scudamore. I'm asked so many times what I would recommend for people who are fans of the secret history. And I haven't read this book yet, but this is always one that I point people in the direction of with the full disclosure of that I haven't read it yet, but it gives me secret history vibes. It's about people who go to a private school where something not very nice happens. And then I think they meet 
later in life, but it says it's a beautifully told decade spanning tale of friendship forged in scandal. And it will appear to Oh, fans of Ishiguro, Ian McEwen, and Donna Tart. So there we go. It does say Donna Tart on the back as well. Then the last one is Kikiko Tamura's There's No Such Thing as an Easy Job, which is translated from the Japanese by Polly Barton. This is giving me Convenience Store Woman vibes by Siaka Murata, which um, I think is different, but they originate from a very similar place because they're both about young women who are rebelling against society's pressure to get an important job but their motivations i think are very different um so this is about a woman who's going from job to to job so those are the five that i am drawn to the most today you know it could be another five any other day if i went through my shelves and picked out some books so i'm going to put these five up on Instagram and get you to vote and then I will let you know which one has been picked and then once I finish work I can start reading it. days later i owe you a catch-up so the results of that um question out on instagram were really interesting the book that was your top pick for me to read was english monsters by james scudmore and i think that's probably because i gave more context to it than perhaps the other books and i mentioned secret history so i think that's why that one in particular won then second was greensmith by alia whiteley third was there's no such thing as an easy job by kikiko tsumura i have a feeling this one may have been higher if i'd been able to fit it into the the poll because you can only have four options so i had to say if you wanted me to read this one dm me which i think is obviously just an extra it's an extra step people have to do so i, I think it would have got more votes and been higher up but still so you can see there's a <laughs> there's a bookmark in this one which is a spoiler uh and then number four was the sparrow by mary doria russell and number five was the hierarchies by ros anderson Interestingly, I also received many messages about the Sparrow telling me that I should be aware that hand disfigurement is a huge theme in this book and not particularly in a good way. Um, and that's something that maybe I want to be aware of, you know, having hand disfigurements myself uh, before going into it. And I didn't know that. So that's something that I am going to uh, think about, read the beginning of, see if it's something I want to read. The main character has gone into space, gone to this alien planet, has come back and his hands have uh, been injured and he has disfigurements um, and that's supposed to be part of, of the plot line in general. So I'm going to find out more about that and see if it's something that I do wish to read. Aside from that, your number one pick was English Monsters by James Scudamore. And I read about 50 pages of this, but I just know that this book is not for me. The writing style is very much like Ian McEwan. And I think if you like his writing, then you would enjoy this book. I think the comparison to Donna Tartt is fair enough, given that it's about going to a school where something pretty awful happens. I'm pretty sure in this book, it's going to be sexual assault, but I wouldn't say that they were vastly similar in, in other respects. It's one of those books where I'm reading it and knowing that it's very well written, but it's just not the kind of thing that speaks to me and that's absolutely fine. So fans of Ian McEwan, yes, um, me, not so much. Then number two, vastly different, as I said, was Greensmith by Alia Whiteley. These books could not be more dissimilar. This is inspired by things like Doctor Who and Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It's about a horticulturalist called Penelope Greensmith and she has been collecting seeds of all species of plants on the planet and she has this thing called the vice which can almost 
it's like a flower press, but it, it flower presses the seeds so she can keep everything in a really compact space. Then this virus sweeps the earth and turns all plants to goop. And someone turns up at her door and says, Penelope, you're going to have to come with me and save the universe. So she goes on this adventure with him and it's a really fun, ridiculous experiment. I don't think that it's brilliant. I don't think that everything is tied up neatly. I don't think it's as coherent as it could be, but... It is fun, and, and what I liked is that when she goes to other planets, she can't really conceptualize them. She can't see them properly. Her brain can't cope, so her brain morphs the planets into things that she can understand. So one of the planets is full of flamingos because she knows what flamingos are. So that's an Alice in Wonderland reference. It reminded me a little bit of the book Flash Forward as well. So yeah, I am mean, not a favorite, but it was absurd, and I definitely enjoyed the ride. Then I picked up number three, which is There's No Such Thing as an Easy Job by Kikiko Tsumura, which is the one that I'm reading right now. It's translated from the Japanese by Polly Barton, and it's split into chapters that follow one character as she goes from job to job, and I've read the first two chapters, so I'm up to page 150, so she has been to two separate jobs. And this book, I am thoroughly enjoying. It's a book that is comforting but unsettling, at the same time and it kind of catches you off guard in ways that you wouldn't particularly expect and I'm finding the small surprises reading this book just really satisfying and interesting compelling um, as I said it's about a woman who is not sure what she wants to do with her life and therefore she is going from job to job and she kind of camouflages herself into whatever job she goes into. In the first job she is working in surveillance and she is observing an author who is writing, staying at home pretty much all the time and she's watching him because they suspect that maybe he's hiding contraband either knowingly or a friend is hiding stuff at his flat and he is not aware of it and because she is spending all of her time watching him she starts to emulate him in certain ways she starts to eat the food that he is eating she's really interested in the novel that he's writing so she tries to zoom in into the screen and then the shop at the place that she works starts stocking the books that he's written before which kind of hold clues to the life that she happens to be living. So it's like everything is feeding into each other and the cause and effect is really blurred because how can a novel that he wrote several years ago be affecting what she's doing right now? And that's a theme that appears to be carrying on throughout, just that life is this timeless, not necessarily meaningless thing, but that we're searching for meaning in all of these strange places and finding it where we wouldn't perhaps expect to. The novelist that she's observing in the first chapter has this fear of ghosts because of media that he's been consuming recently. So at various points he looks around because he thinks maybe there's a ghost behind him and he happens to look at the camera that she is looking at him through. He doesn't know it's there, but that's the direction that he's looking in. And it really unnerves her because then she thinks, well, maybe I am a ghost but also I feel like you're bringing me to life by observing me and that's not the point of this job. The point of this job was for me to observe you and for me to be kind of liquid and not really real and just be in the background, so please stop trying to manifest me into your life. I'm about a third of the way through, really enjoying it, so I'm going to keep reading it and I will talk to you about it more in my wrap-up at the end of the month. I'll also continue listening to The Woman in White. I would love to know if you have read any of these books that I mentioned today um, and whether you have any books that you have purchased just because they have reminded you of books that you have really enjoyed in the past let me know in a comment down below i hope that you are all doing okay i'm sending lots of love to you all and i'll be back with another video very soon